Board of City Council meeting to order for Monday, December 4th, 2017, 6.30 p.m. All members of the City Council are present. Others include Laura Dogan, our City Manager, and our City Clerk Treasurer, James Johnson. The next item is to approve the minutes of November 20th, 2017, and also the minutes of November 27th, 2017. I would entertain a motion. Commissioner, I make a motion to approve both uh, 20 November and 27 November council. Motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Made and seconded. Discussion on the motion? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Next item is comments by members of the public. Um, <clears throat> we have several who are here for the presentation, so I'll <clears throat> go right down to Pam Lads, and she had a budget question. I do. Uh, my question is, when you get to the part of the budget, if you could clarify what's meant by communication, it's listed in every department, every segment, and if you could just clarify that when you get to it, that would be much appreciated. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And then we had Ann Shirillo, budget issue, budget question. Um, yeah, two thoughts uh, based on the last uh, budget meeting. Um, one was uh, with respect to the police department's budget um, and the addition of uh, a police dispatcher for about $55,000. I mean, I understand why uh, Seth would want that. Um, on the other hand, over this entire year, um, no other city uh, or township has stepped up and said they wanted Newport um, dispatch to handle the dispatch because obviously that would cost them 10000 and I assume they're still getting it for free from the state. And then, until that changes, you know, pure, poor communities around this, uh, around this area are probably not going to be willing to add $10,000 to their budget. So I think we have a cart before the horse and that it would be better to hold off on the dispatcher until um, Seth got <coughs> Um, our police chief got um, commitments from communities that said, you know, if you do a 24-7 uh, dispatch, then we will sign up with you. And if he got four or five of those, then it would be worth it to spend $55,000 on a dispatcher. But until that time comes, um, I don't think so. Um, and, and the second thing, I mean, it would be nice and, and better and safer a little bit, but the trade-off isn't there. Um, and the second thing was, um, I thought it was such a good idea that you decided to take $30,000 from the Walmart um, amount of money that you've got put aside, which I understand is around $95,000, but then I, for Renaissance, then I thought, well, why don't you take another $20,000 from that? And that would mean that we residents would be back to paying what we initially were paying, which was $10,000 about five or six years ago per year for Renaissance. And that, that would be a $55,000 and a $20,000 uh, cut in the budget. And remember, last year you went up almost three quarters of a million dollars on the, on the amount that citizens had to pay. So when you sort of say, oh, well, we're only leveling uh, this year, even though it is a $58,000 increase right now, really, you're up almost three quarters of a million plus another 50000 which is, as we say in Brooklyn, huge. 
because I was originally from Brooklyn, and that's why I say it wrong. Um, so um, I'd ask you to consider both of those things in lowering this year's budget. Thank you. Um, Laurie Grimm. Laurie City of Newport. Uh, I wanted to come tonight because um, I wanted to publicly thank the council and our um, uh, public works department for the job that the company did on painting the water tower this fall. Um, I did have an opportunity to stop one day and thank the gentlemen who were working. Um, the color is fantastic. Um, much better than the old baby blue that it was. Uh, blends into the surroundings very nicely. So I did want to say thank you, and I know that um, I was very much opposed to the writing of the word Newport on the water tower because I didn't believe that we needed to spend the extra money um, and because the water tower can't really be seen from downtown um, at all. Uh, and I just want to thank you for not uh, moving forward with that. Uh, I think, but I do want you to know my personal thanks um, that the water, it is something that I see every day since I live right there and uh, the color is very, very nice so I wanted to say thank you on that. Um, and I do have a question for consideration. Uh, just in conversation with people around the area, for, um, for some reason it's come up in a couple of conversations. Um, I'm wondering if our uh, city manager's office and our our council and, and uh, would consider the possibility of implementing some sort of um, credit card or debit card use uh, when paying uh, for things um, for the city. There's an awful lot of people that um, don't use checking accounts anymore, don't have checkbooks, have to go get a cashier's check. Um, and I've heard some people complain about that process. Um, I know for my family, um, we happen to use a credit card that gives us money back and it would be helpful <laughs> in the amount that we have to pay. Uh, so it is, I realize that those uh, services do come with a fee um, at times, but I'm just putting that out there for consideration uh, for something for the city council, city manager, and our um, city treasurer to consider. I was just wondering, you, know, you keep on reading about down here on Main Street about the motel, a hotel in it, or a brewery or anything. Has anything been done? Or anybody heard anything from Mr. Goldberg? Because the story going out there that it wasn't bought with EB5 money, it was bought with Mr. Stingers for Curios money. So, and again, like her, if you're talking to a lot of people out there, they're just wondering. It's in the hands of the receiver. That's all, that's all we can say. It's in Mr. Goldberg's hands. He's the one that's controlling that property. So you can't really make a decision what goes in there then until he goes he, through that it's in, it's in the okay. court system in Florida. Mr. Mr. Goldberg right. is the one that has control of that property. It was turned over to him in an agreement between Mr. Quirios and, Mr. and the courts, and that was turned over to Mr. Goldberg. So hopefully the city will hear something soon. Yeah. It's okay. however no, no. fast it moves in the Florida court All system. Right. Okay. Um, so right now we can't do a thing to that property. I mean, All right. So well, no, no. I just wanted to let you know what was going on out there. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. All right. Everyone else who signed up appears to be here for the snowmobiles. Vast, vast, vast snowmobile. So what I'm going to do is we will move on to the agenda of the proposed vast feeder trail presentation. We have Roger Goldsman, and after his presentation, um, we will have, because of the nature of it, we'll have a question and answer period for for this. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Manager, Council, for allowing me to come and present this to you tonight. I have a short presentation um, that I'm going to give to you, and then after, I'm more than happy to answer questions. Um, I do have some um, people here that may uh, help me with some of those questions, um, but I'd be happy to take them. Um, so 
My name is Roger Goslin, uh, and I'm here to present to you an idea of how I feel that we can bo help boost the economy of Newport by bringing snowmobiles into the city. And I'm sorry, I try to. I know I got to talk to you guys, but I'm trying to get everybody covered here. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a Northeast Kingdom native. I was born in uh, Newport, raised in Derby, uh, pretty much all my life. I just recently moved to Westfield uh, to be closer to work, but I'm still a Northeast Kingdom guy. Um, I am uh, the president of Orleans County Snowmobile Association, which is a snowmobile association made up of seven clubs in Orleans County, um, all throughout the county. And basically what I do is I run the organization and I represent the Orleans County clubs at the state, and by state I mean vast level, Vermont Association of Snow Travelers. And I'm the Orleans County director for them. So vast Vermont Association of Snow Travelers is not a state entity. Um, state government entity it is a nonprofit organization that is in charge of managing the snowmobile trails in Vermont. I'm also involved with uh, local clubs, uh, Derby Drift Duster Snowmobile Club, as well as Country Riders and Jay. Um, I'm, I've held several positions in all those clubs, as well as uh, grooming for them. I run the, uh, the groomers, so I'm pretty heavily involved in snowmobiling, and I do about five to six thousand miles a year on my snowmobile, so. I'm able to get out and kind of see what the sort of impact the sport has um, around the uh, northeast part of the United States plus Canada as well. And as you'll see, I'll have some pictures from different parts of those areas. Uh, so why am I here? I'm proposing a feeder trail uh, into the city of Newport. Way back several years ago, probably before I was born, there used to be a feeder trail here. The snowmobiles used to come down where um, Vermont Route 191 is, the interstate access road, and they used to be able to access downtown Newport. And for some reason, probably due to development, that has changed. And I felt like one of the goals that I had as uh, Orleans County Director when I took that position was to try to promote and get snowmobiles to as many parts as the, of the county as I could, specifically businesses. Um, at snowmobile clubs, we are here to get snowmobiles to the businesses and obviously to people's homes, but um, we want to try to boost the economy. Um, a study that we did, it was about 10 years ago now, um, Johnson State College did it for us, and um, they ended up coming up with um, um, $500 million a year is what the snowmobile industry contributes to the state of Vermont's economy. And I'm assuming it's more now because that is 10-year-old data. So we provide the infrastructure or the trails needed to facilitate snowmobile access into downtown Newport. That's what I'm proposing. Um, to contribute to the economy and uh, make sure that Newport is a premier destination for people traveling from Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. Um, New York, anywhere. Um, I'd like to get them downtown here so they can help help the city out. So I want to get these guys here, people of all ages, from snowmobilers in this room that we have that are 80 years old to snowmobilers that are 12 years old. And snowmobilers that are 8 years old technically can legally ride the trails. I want to get those guys and all these guys, probably not all at once, <laughs> down into this restaurant, this plaza here and the businesses associated with it and eventually downtown I'm kind of being I'm, I'm, I'm being optimistic thinking we can get them back into downtown but um, my goal again is to just start slowly and, and get us in there working with you guys little by little to try to make sure that we're doing this the appropriate way these are different pictures taken throughout the area. Lucher store, Newport Center. These people all bought gas. They went in, they bought food, <coughs> they bought snacks. They contributed to Newport Center's local economy. Vermont Pie and Pasta, this group, this is all, these are all snowmobilers, people that rode there. Um, just a group that came in. They were riding from Maine to, um, to Mich Michigan. They were doing a big group ride. They contacted me, and we hooked them up with a local business in Derby that has trail access to it. Again, key, access, key word is trail access. The tavern, of course, as you guys know, we like to line their front lawn um, with snowmobiles as well. Derby shortstop, here's a couple of young snowmobilers riding with their parents, of course, filling up their snowmobiles at, the, at a local uh, gas station. And then, of course, here's our groomer, or one of the club's groomers, um, grooming to uh, Little John's in, in uh, I guess that's technically Coventry, but, um, you know, they pulled into the parking lot, turned around, and went back out. So now snowmobilers have a good, safe trail to get to the uh, to get to the store. We also try to accommodate things by doing signs, um, trying to direct the snowmobilers to the business because if they're not from the area, they're not going to know where the East Side Restaurant is, where the Cow Palace is, etc. So we do stuff like that, 
And then here's another example. All right, turn left to go to Vermont Pine Pasta, turn right to go to Champlain Valley Equipment. So again, we exist to get people and snowmobilers to these businesses. So the big question is, can snowmobilers coincide with everyday city living and working? Well, in Jonquier, Quebec, a population of 54,000 people, there's snowmobilers going up and down the sidewalks and patronizing all their businesses. This is a hotel here, um, a popular one that snowmobilers go to. Here they're on a sidewalk that's not it, that's plowed, it's still got snow on it. They cross the road at a pedestrian crosswalk, go to the hotel, spend the night, spend some money, and then they leave the next day. Amos, Quebec. People stop at the grocery store, throw their helmets in the car, go get their food for the evening, go to the hotel, spend some more money, and then get on the trails the next day. Population 13,000, still bigger than Newport. All right? Tabusac Ferry, and this is kind of a little bit different than city, but we can coincide, coincide with tractor trailer trucks on a ferry. All right? This ferry transports um, thousands of vehicles per day across the waterway up in Canada, and we just line right up with the traffic and we drive right on just as if we're a motor, motor vehicle. And we are registered motor vehicles. We do have to be registered to ride the trail, of course. Um, here's an example of a trail that we've taken on the side of a road similar to um, the interstate access road. You know, it's a nice wide road, multiple lanes. Again, we can make it work. If it's planned ahead, if we pre-plan, if we work with the Department of Public Works, we can make this all work. In this uh, little village up in Mistissini, Quebec, we're going down the side of the, uh, the road. Okay? Why am I showing you pictures of Quebec? Well, Quebec is very snowmobile friendly. They've embraced the income that snowmobilers bring to their communities. So they allow it and they make it very easy for us to get into their towns and into their villages. Vermont is the same way, but they're all very small most of, the, most of the time. So when I try to compare apples to apples, I try to get bigger cities comparing to Newport and not a small town like Glover or Albany. Chicoutimi, Quebec, population 66,000, about the size of Burlington. Again, right down the sidewalk, right down the city streets, right to the hotels. Okay? Nobody, um, nobody has a problem with it because it's part of the culture. People are used to seeing snowmobiles around there because they know what good comes of it. So what about Newport? So here's Vermont's uh, 4,700 miles of snowmobile trails. It used to be a little bit more, but um, you know, as development happens, we're still trying to, to keep these things in place, but we do have to give some trails up here and there. All right, so here's a zoomed in picture of those 4,700 miles. As you can see, Newport here on the screen, um, we have a trail that comes down across Crowdy Beach, um, and it, is lacking a trail coming down into downtown. All right, so this is where we want to get. We want to get to Newport. All right, now, unfortunately, there's not very many pictures of Newport during the winter time on Google, because everybody kind of hibernates. Um, but this is it. This is what we see when we're crossing the trail on the lake. This is what we see. Now, for a little bit of history about ice crossings, Bass is trying to eliminate ice crossings. And we're doing our best to maintain the ones that we have on them for Magog, because we realize that that's how we get from one side of the county to the other. So we're going to maintain those, but we don't want to add anymore. I don't want to send anybody south on Lake Memphis Magog because as all, you all may or may not know, the ice does get thin and it just becomes dangerous. So we're trying to stay off the lake. It would be very easy if we could just go right down the lake like a lot of villages do in, in Quebec and go right up off the shore and there you are in downtown. But unfortunately we can't do that here. So this is what I'm proposing, and I'm going to come back to this as there's questions. I'm going to go on, and I'll come back to this um, as needed. But this green line here on the top of all these screens, that's Bass Trail 14A. That's existing right now at this point. So to give you a little bit of orientation, here's North Country High School. The football field that goes along the edge, which is the current bike path, um, on Freeman Street. And um, it curves behind the Legion, which is, I guess I could use this to be fancier, curves behind the Legion, crosses into Prouty Beach, and then loops down over the lake. To my knowledge, we don't have um, an issue with anybody on Freeman Street. And maybe there's somebody here tonight that will you know, tell me something I don't know. But we coincide with those, those neighbors pretty well. Um, and so that is, again, that is the bike path, and it's not plowed. It's just, it's groomed, just as a regular snowmobile trail. So what I'm proposing is, uh, right where it turns and heads west over the lake, the lake's right about here, to go due south 
on the current bike path that is not maintained during the winter. It's just not plowed. People, I'm sure, walk on it, but um, it's not plowed at all. And when you get down to about this area here, it turns into Broadview, Broadview Ave. And there are some, there are some bullets there that prevent vehicles from going up the trail or up the path during the summer. We'd have to remove those and, and that wouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, but we'd have to come down Broadview Ave. And I realize that going down a street is not optimal. Trust me, I would rather not do it. But there's no other way that I know of. Um, I've driven around and walked around and I haven't had, had any luck finding on the other way other than going on the water. So the proposal would be to go down Broadview Ave. Um, eventually, maybe if we can find a trail that'll go down through the, and I got a better picture here, that'll go down through these woods that Dina uh, Gray owns, but that's down the road. I think right now the best place would be to go down the edge of Landing Street, which we can make use, and actually if we get enough snow, we could probably move completely off the street and groom the side of it, depending on how cold things get. Um, we come off Landing Street, go in the uh, parking lot of, or in the driveway of the east side, and head due south again, and then this is kind of where it gets to be optional and kind of work as is and see how things go. So we have we can have the option of going down the bike path, which right now is plowed, but doesn't have to be from what I've been told. And then, and also there is a sidewalk on the side of uh, Route 105 here, so we wouldn't be taking away from the sidewalk. And then once you get to the, right here is the entrance to the waterfront cinemas, the most, most northern uh, entrance. We would um, allow snowmobiles to come in, access hoagies, which I talked to that business owner today, and he's very much in support of this. Um, the cinema, the great outdoors, Wendy's, and of course from here they'd access the east side. Um, and one thing the east side can attest to, and, and Dina is here tonight, so she, she could a answer this if you had any questions. Um, they, as the lake has progressively gotten not safe, they've lost more business because people are less apt to come down there. And again, we don't want to stake down there because if we stake a trail on the ice, somebody goes through, they're going to say, well, you staked the trail, it must have been safe, right? Even though we have liability insurance and we're not, we can't be held liable for that because it is a snowmobile trail by state statute, um, the fact of the matter is we still could be sued and we don't want that. So um, anyway, they would come down here and access these and then uh, assuming um, the Palmerlo estate or the, uh, the property management is okay with it, then they just go down to Vista Foods if they needed to. Down the road, I would like to see us get across the railroad bridge. We'd be more than happy to put down planking to protect the bridge so it doesn't hurt the bridge at all, and then get to downtown. But I'm trying to take this in baby steps. And I, again, I'll come back to this. So. Um, these, I can bring these back up. So I know I'm going to have a few questions. I'm going to try to address them ahead of time. So what about noise? So Vermont statute, um, tw Title 23, 3205, I'm not going to read this all to you, but essentially it says snowmobiles, snowmobilers cannot modify their exhaust to make them, they can't modify them at all because of EPA and also noise, but they can't be any, anything more than 82 decibels. A vacuum cleaner, from what I found on Google, is roughly 70 decibels. The fine for that is $622. So that happens very little because the police out there do carry decibel meters and they can enforce that. Uh, Vermont state statute um, talks about operating in reason and prudent manner. Prudent manner. Um, so there would be a speed limit on this road, say 10 miles an hour or something, whatever we find that's comparable. Um, or even if we didn't put a snow uh, speed limit on the road and they were caught by the police speeding down the road, they could get a $392 fine. It's really left up to the police officer whether or not they think that they were operating in a prudent or unsafe manner. All right, so here's an example of what they do in Brighton Island Pond, not to be confused. So I'm, I'm proposing this be the Vermont Snowmobile City. The Vermont Snowmobile Capital is Island Pond, and I would never want to take that away from them. Um, we have uh, Trails uh, Coordinator Dave Page for the Brighton Snowmobile Club. He is here tonight, and he can answer questions directly from you. He's been doing this for a very long time, and he's dealt with all these homeowners um, that are are dealing with the snowmobile trail going down their street. I'm going to pull up a better sign here. So as you can see, it's marked residential area. It is a snowmobile trail. For the traffic, it's 30 miles an hour, which I don't know what it is over on Broadview. I think it's 25. Um, public highway, keep right, so it's telling the snowmobiles, stay to the right of the road because there could be a car passing you. 
Um, speed limit's 10 miles an hour, and it, this specific trail has a curfew, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. And again here, same thing. Snowmobilers have to, regardless of whether this stop ahead sign is there or not, or it's just the city street stop ahead sign, they have to follow the same rules as if they're driving a motor vehicle. They have to stop and follow the speed limits. Again, another sign there that the club is willing to work with the city on making sure we have the proper signage. I guess that's kind of where I'm trying to go with this. Um, and we have stop signs, stop ahead signs, speed limit signs, and all that kind of stuff. Trail close signs. So about the trail curfew, um, again, Vermont State Statutes, this is the, this is the law, all right? 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, if anybody's caught, um, other than a trail groomer, which a trail groomer is exempt because typically when we groom the trails, it is late at night, and trail groomers don't make very much noise. And they just go by once and then and that's it. But in this, in this instance, they'd be going by twice because it is a dead end trail. Um, it's $174. If they're caught breaking that curfew, so that's easy to enforce, right? Set, and I don't want to make you know work for Officer DeSanto or Chief DeSanto, but they could easily park a vehicle there, and if they see a snowmobile go by after 11 p.m. at night. Guess what? You get a $174 ticket. I doubt they'll do it again. Um, by the way, when we do close the trail, or if we do get to close this trail at the end of the season, it's $620 if they catch somebody going down to use the trail once it's closed. So the club would post it as closed. We put it all over the internet. Um, it get advertised everywhere. And so if some say the trail is closed and they get a dusting of snow, which is we need more than a dusting of snow to open the trails, as you all know, if somebody comes down through um, from the high school during lunch break and they, they go down through there, they could get a $622 fine. Um, so we work with local law enforcement, all right? Um, nice picture, so by the way. They have a nice, wonderful <laughs> snow. I think they've got two of them. So, um, so yeah, we, and this is actually where the trail crosses. It's way up here on Prouty Beach. And as you can see, it's quite a ways to get down to downtown Newport. But anyway, we work intimately with the, um, with the local law enforcement. I am not a member of or on the board for the local club, but we do have a club representative here. It's the North Country Mountaineers. From, uh, they cover Irisburg, Coventry. Um, and as well as Newport, they would be working with the law enforcement to make sure everything's going okay, but because I am proposing this idea, I would make sure that it is happening as well. I do my best anyway. So what about liability? Good question. Um, so if this goes through and um, the city, you guys all agree that this can happen, um, the city would sign a landowner permission form. And what that does is that exempts them from any liability because they're giving us free permission. If they were charging us, then they would be liable. But because they are volunteering a city street for permission, then they would be they would not be held liable. Okay, um, a and this is more referring to liability insurance for the snowmobiles. A snowmobile has to have liability insurance at the minimum. Most people carry full coverage, um, but at the very minimum, you have to have liability insurance. And if you don't, it's one hundred and sixty-two dollars. This is a picture of the permission form that the city would be signing. If, uh, if this gets approved. Um, and then again, this is verbiage um, covering the liability for the landowners. VAST will defend the landowners because as you know, anybody can sue anybody. It doesn't mean that it's actually gonna get, um, you know, monetary values are not gonna be exchanged, but VAST will defend the landowner. We have a million dollar insurance policy. And I've gotta say, knock on wood, in the 15 years that I've been involved with the sport and at this level, um, I haven't seen that happen because most people know that if they do something um, that's not reasonable, that they're probably held, going to be held responsible for it. Um, so that covers that. So what's our proposal? Permission granted on an annual basis for this trail. So every year we have to come back to you and say, hey, you know, did it go okay last year? Are you happy with it? Can we do it again? Or do you not want us to do it again? And Obviously, the trail could be changed. So I could get a phone call from the Department of Public Works in the middle of February and say, "Hey, this isn't working. We need to we need to change this." And at any point in time, the city can completely revoke their permission and say the trail's closed. We're not doing it anymore. So this is kind of what I call a pilot program because this is fairly new and it's a, in a you know a case by case basis and see how it goes. Um, we work with Public Works to make sure that we find the best fit location. And again, unfortunately, Broadview is really the only fit for that section of the trail. But once you get down to the east side area, we can kind of 
vary our location based on what the businesses want, what um, what the uh, parking lot is going to let us do down there. Change it as needed and maintain constant communication, of course, with the city. And an added benefit, if you snowshoe cross-country ski, it'll be a nice groomed trail instead of an unplowed trail for you to go down. So that's always kind of a, a nice thing that we like to throw in it. And of course, the, the city has to allow that use, but I don't think they'd have a problem with it. We, uh, we coexist with cross-country skiers and snowshoers all the time and provide them a free groomed trail. So, help us make Newport, Vermont, Snowmobile City. Is there any questions? Uh, there's a gentleman in the back and then... Yes, I just wanted a question from Art is that uh, I'm fairly familiar with other towns in New Hampshire. I mean, you mentioned Quebec. <laughs> And, but big towns like Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, and, and some of the other ones, isn't it true that if they didn't have the snowmobilers to bring money into their towns in the wintertime, that they'd have a very difficult time even to survive? It is, yeah, and I mean, uh, I don't, obviously that's not true for Newport because we're surviving without it, but I feel that it'd be a really, really big boost for the economy. And, and um, the, the goal is to, you could say tomorrow that there's a snowmobile trail going into Newport, and people would come down here but snowmobilers, contrary to some belief, are law-abiding citizens. There are a few renegades out there just like anything else, and unfortunately we can't control that. But snowmobilers want to see a sign that's saying that this is a snowmobile trail, I'm going the right way. They want to see a sign that says, we're allowing snowmobiles here, because they're going to feel more comfortable going down to those businesses. And that's why I want to get that, that communication going to make sure we have a good signed trail. There's no confusion, and everybody knows where it's going to go. Yes. Kenny Thomas, Newport, why wouldn't we do this? Um, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just a second. Okay. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Jillian Stamforth. I live on Broadview. Um, I spoke to Roger Goldson the other day, and I've also spoken to some people at the city. Um, I've lived on Broadview for 28 years. And I think that my husband and I have lived there longest of anyone there now. Um, there are seven houses on Broadview, and I went to five of them that I could get hold of because I just found out about this last week. And my current neighbors are not in favor of this. Um, and I've drawn up a letter that I will give to the city council. Um, I don't want to impede things. I don't want to be seen as a negative um, force, but I do have to say, living on Broadview, it's a very narrow street. It has a, recre a designated recreational trail on it right now. I very rarely seen a walking, biking trail, snowshoeing, um, cross-country skiing trail that coexists well with motorized vehicles. Um, I walk my dog all the time. I have neighbors who walk dogs. We walk in the park. I have been well aware of the vast trails in the park. And there's many times when I've been menaced by snowmobilers who come off the vast trails and use the park. There's a dip where they jump, and um, I am frightened sometimes and I know you talked about renegades. Um, we have two 90 degree angles that come onto Broadview. One is from Duchess, one is at the very south end from Landing Street. We have accidents at both those intersections all the time. The stop sign at the end of Duchess is taken down at least once a year in the winter by um, traffic coming out of the high school. We have heavy volume of high school traffic I work at the high school, so I'm also kind of aware of the traffic pattern. I walk to school every day from my street. Um, we have a lot of teenagers who drive recklessly at 7.30 and at 2.40, and they take that turn without stopping. They take the bottom turn without stopping. Um, I have been to the city council twice. Once Dina helped me out because I was worried about commercial traffic coming down our street. And I was also worried when Mr. Malkin put in his properties because all we've seen is increased vehicular traffic over the years. And it's made my neighborhood unsafe. There are no sidewalks. 
Um, you know, you say you go from 6 in the morning to 11 at night, and the snowmobiles make a little bit more noise than a vacuum. My bedroom is 25 feet from the middle of the road. I really don't understand how I'm expected to have a good night's sleep when I'll have 50 or 60 vacuums driving by my house. Um, the, the fact that you say there won't be a speed limit posted, the kids at school, and I know these kids, and I love them, and I fear for their safety, when they come across the, the lake, which they do to come to school, they tell me they reach speeds up to 80 miles an hour. When they, I can just see it in my mind's eye as they turn south, of what you're suggesting, that is a straight shot down the bike path. You'll remove those little things, that, those little posts, and they will now be speeding down my street at I don't know what speed. Um, high schoolers are now allowed to leave the school for lunch. I can tell you that I know that there are many high school students who will use their cars and whatever vehicle they can get to make a quick run down to Wendy's to get lunch now, which they've not been able to do so. This is, this is something that isn't even factored into our traffic problem yet because it's just starting this year. Um, the other thing I don't understand is your liability. You put up the fact that it's $25,000 if someone is killed. So if I'm driving out of my driveway one day and I get hit by four snowmobiles that are going 70 miles an hour, is my life now worth $25,000? Is my neighbor's life, who's an older gentleman who walks a little pug dog religiously every day, twice a week, twice a day, is his life worth $25,000? And if his dog is killed, what happens to his dog? All these fines that you posted, $174 for using the travel and its clothes, and $162 for speeding, none of that begins to compare with how it's going to impact our street. It's a very small street. There are seven houses on it. I couldn't get hold of the other two people on my street because I just found out about this last week. So I'm going to continue. I also got some support from other people who live in Hoskins. We also, right now, we have people coming down our street to go out on the ice on the fishing access. They come down now on ATVs and snowmobiles in the winter without permission. And this happens all the time. And I can only imagine if it becomes a legal, registered, approved egress and access to the lake that that traffic will just increase mine mentally. So I feel caught between a rock and a very hard place. Um, I don't want to stop snowmobiles from coming into Newport, Vermont. I don't want to stop people from growing their businesses and enjoying winter. But I, I just can't see that Broadview Avenue as small and narrow as it is without sidewalks. Um, how narrow is it compared to the regular street? What, what's the difference? What's the differential that you always talk well, about? Well, they never put it in sidewalks because it wasn't. Is enough. it more narrow than a regular city street? Yeah. What's what's yes. the, I, mean, I, I would have to ask the city manager or the public works. Right I hear how narrow is that street? You must, Dan. Uh, you know, I, it's probably twenty feet. I, I, it's not a it's not a typical uh, main artery. When they, I know when they. to Landing Street? Oh, it's probably the same as Landing Street. It's when, the same as Landing Street. Landing Street also doesn't have houses on one complete side of it because that's a designated wetland. The other thing is when they redid our street, they couldn't put in sidewalks because there wasn't enough room to put a sidewalk and still have two vehicles passing each other. So all the bike path, all the walkers, all the people on our street. When I went to school in the morning, I almost get run over. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little long-winded here. I'm going to sit down a minute. Um, it, it's not a good situation. And I'm sorry, I'm a little under the weather, so my voice is a little hoarse as well. Um, but I would just ask for more time and more consideration. I didn't know this was coming up tonight. I didn't know there could be a vote. We were not advised. We were given small notices at which point I did call Roger and we, we spoke, we had a good conversation. But I, I have to tell you, I don't feel all my questions have been answered and I, I don't even know where to start. This list is very long, so I'd like to give it to the City Council.
this point? That's okay. Just to let you know, there is no vote tonight. It okay. won't happen until the next meeting. Um, these are the people that I don't know who to give this to. Sure. These are the people that signed. Do you have a copy of this? I have a copy. Okay. And these are people of. Right. Those are copies. Yeah. I have copies. Thank you. Can I address, can I address some of her concerns, Mr. Mayor? Can I address yes. some of her concerns? So the liability insurance, um, yes, that's all, that only covers 25000 and that's also the reason why many of us don't carry only liability insurance. Um, but VAST has a million-dollar insurance policy, and I don't even think if it was 6 or $7 million or a billion dollars, that would compensate for a loss of life. Um, our goal is to make sure that there is no loss of life, uh, but unfortunately I can't guarantee anything. Um, I said there wouldn't have to be speed limit signs, but there can be, um, and, they, and it can be enforced. And again, I can't speak for 100% of the snowmobilers out there. I do feel that if we did have an issue, unfortunately, it would probably be coming from the high school, from some kids at the high school. And I don't mean to say that in a negative way, but I don't. it's not going to be somebody traveling four hours up here from Connecticut that's going to be your issue. Um, but that's why we have law enforcement. That's why we have a police department. Um, and so my, I guess my only request would be, and I understand where you're coming from. It is a tough position. My request would be to maybe try this for one year and see how it goes. Well, I have to say, when I saw one of your slides and you asked for good, safe trails, and it showed a trail that was a snowmobile trail, and there looked like there was 12 snowmobiles on it. Mm -hmm. That's a good, safe trail. I can't imagine that coming down my street. Yeah. And I don't under I don't know if people, I don't know the etiquette in the <coughs> detail. I don't I don't know, but if you have a whole crew of snowmobiles coming down the street, how do they know that it's also <coughs> a street where there's cars and people and dogs and walkers and, and you won't have people coming? I just have this vision at the bottom of my street, not that nine inch feet turn that's a bit blind. You have a whole bunch of snowmobiles coming one way and you have a, a they, car. They have to stay to the right side. They have to hug the edge because if they were in the middle, they wouldn't be able to steer anyway because they have to be near the edge. Um, and you're not going to see a group like that. That was for a group photo, and the purpose of that was to show you the amount of snowmobilers out there that would love to come and patronize your businesses. Um, but single file down the road, that's that's normal etiquette. Um, but, uh, and yeah. the other question I'd like to ask the council, isn't the city ordinance on noise at 7 a.m.? 11 I, the other thing is, you know, having 80 decibels of noise rushing down my street at, at all hours of the day and night, it's not really very comforting. I mean, it's really not good for my health, I must admit. Okay. Thank you. I've got something that I thought of real quick. Brighton, have they had major issues as far as, we have someone from Brighton, like you said you had a representative. We do. If someone could address the co coexistence of snow machines in residential neighborhood. Uh, Roger, can you turn that back to the uh, slide you had where my truck was involved in it? Sure. <coughs> this, whoops. This street right here, not the one where my truck is parked, but the street that's across the road there. That is part of our snowmobile system. That is a main thorough route. There um, is one of the, it's not a feeder trail, it's the main route where on a given weekend is probably, I'm going to estimate uh, conservatively, 250, 300 sleds over down there on a weekend. During the week, the traffic's much lighter. Uh, that's because it's a main route. It takes you straight through if you're going like the Norton or Canaan. That particular street there in the wintertime when there's snow, is about the same width as what I heard um, the gentleman say, 20 feet. S granted, there's only three, four houses on that street. But, and at the end of that uh, street, it doesn't show too well, but there's a four-way intersection at the bottom of that street. Uh, can you point it out, Roger, where the four-way intersection is there? Uh, no, uh, next street down. Both streets have a four-way intersection. We have had very, very, very little problem. I won't say none because I'd be lying through my teeth. 
and I wouldn't insult anyone's intelligence and say none. Um, the only house that has had a problem with um, the snowmobile is coming down is the big white house that you see right there on the corner. And part of the issue there is the hedge that goes all the way around. She also has a problem with automobiles because her hedge doesn't let her see anything until the car is three quarters of the way out in the road. Um, snowmobiles are, for the majority, there's always the one that you um, hope that the police are sitting there when he goes by that do create a problem. But for 95% of the traffic that goes down through there, there are no issues. Um, they're all very curious. They stop at the stop signs. Because the one the one factor you have to remember with the snowmobilers, they don't want to get hit with a car either because they know where they end up last. And just a disclaimer too, there won't be 250 snowmobiles that's what coming down because Dave was, Dave's point was that's a main thoroughfare through Island Pond. This is a dead end trail, so um, I'd like and to see plenty of business coming down. What if there are 250 or 300 acres? That would be a, a good, well, it, you know, I, we'd have to address that, yeah, <laughs> but I don't, I don't foresee that happening. We'll all be dead. There's a gentleman back here. My name is Mike Taylor. I uh, resident a little over on Sloan Street. So, and I guess I was going to make that point. It's a secondary trail, so it's not a thoroughfare. You only have people going if they're going to dine somewhere and come back. Um, as far as noise goes, I can tell you that uh, motorcycles, Harley Davidsons, are a lot harder than a sled. We have in Sloan, we have a lot of people that connect, go to school, and stuff like that. You really can't hear them too much. Um, a couple of those pictures are mine from young kids. I do ride Island Pond. I ride over. Derby to take him out. It'd be yeah. nice to take him to the town here. Um, you know, like you say in Island Pond, you go on the side, you go slow. Um, I, it's really a good thing I'd love to be able to do with my family and friends when they come out. And then this gentleman, and there's another one back there. So. I think the, the rule has been I'm a hiker and I hike in the summer and the winter, and the rule is uh, to avoid the fast trail like the plague because. Um, they're going so fast usually that you're not going to be able to skip over in time. And that's, I guess, also for the person who's cross-country cross skiing. So you, you sh mentioned that in, uh, somewhere in Quebec, um, they coincide on, the, on a sidewalk. How fast is, um, are they allowed to go on the sidewalk? And are people walking si simultaneously with them? Yep, so snowmobiles do go fast. There's no doubt about it, and, but they don't in a residential street neighborhood. Even if they wanted to, it's not only completely dangerous, but they would lose control of their snowmobile. It's not, it's not gonna happen. People are gonna go slow when they're in residential areas. Again, I can't account for that 1%, but a majority of people are going to go slow. They know these trails are sensitive. Um, we have a lot of trails. The Kingdom trails down in Burke, they, those are all snowmobile trails in the winter. Fat bikers use them, cross-country skiers use them, snowshoers use them, and yes, um, we we try to make sure that the snowmobilers, you know, slow to, slow down, go to the side, and a lot of times one of our problems is that the cross-country skiers, the snowshoers, and the hikers will have headphones in, so they don't even hear the snowmobiles coming. So it's kind of a two-way street, plus they're also using our trails as well because we maintain them. So we want to we wanna work with everybody, we really do, there's benefits for everybody, but there's that give and take. Can I just find out how many car, car accidents per year you have in uh, a, a town like Island Pond, and how many accidents with people the snowmobiles have, people uh, just pedestrians, pedestrians mm -hmm. per year in a town like Island Pond or any other town you want to mention? Um, I know in, in the area in Orleans County, it's been car versus, uh, excuse me, snowmobile versus pedestrian. I don't know, I can't think of one off the top of my head in the last 15, 15 years that I've been involved. Uh, we did have, uh, last year we had a person on a main thoroughfare out in Holland, they hit a vehicle with their snowmobile, um, but they just, the snow banks were high and they didn't, they weren't paying attention. They didn't stop at the stop sign, uh, which is kind of important. Um, but Dave, I, I don't know if there's been any in Island Pond that as you know far, of. As far as in Island, Island Pond, snowmobiles with pedestrians, to the best of my knowledge, there hasn't been an incident. As far as cars, like Roger said, 
and I've been involved in this since 1988, and I can tell you there's two snowmobiles that got hit with cars, but it was a case where the car was coming out of side street, they didn't see the snowmobile. The, the snow banks were extremely high. It wasn't, in all honesty, other than, you know, the fact that the snow banks were so high that they didn't see them. It wasn't really anyone's fault. I mean, you have that with automobiles. The snow banks get too high and they, they collide. Uh, we've been very fortunate. As far as out on the main trails, we've had a couple of accidents, in all honesty, have claimed lives. But that's out on your main trails that are out in the woods at 20 foot wide. And they do ride fast out there. I, I wouldn't, there again, I wouldn't insult anyone's intelligence to say no. But snowmobilers, other than like Roger said, that 1% that seems to be a problem in every sport or activity there is going on a road, you go slow because it's difficult and the carbides that uh, control your steering, they cost a lot of money. So most snowmobilers are doing the very best they can to hug to the side. They don't want to ride down that muddy park there. It's not advantageous to them. And they know when they're riding on the edge, they need to go slow. It's just part of, I guess, what you learn as a snowmobiler. Yeah, uh, I'm Bob Stanford, where they live on the broad view. I just wanted to know where this initiative came from. Is it from the town businesses that want to have skidoos downtown, or is it the vast uh, scheme of snowmobilers that want to have access to the town? I'm trying to understand how what's driving this. Is it the it's a, downtown or is it the skidoers? It's a little bit of both. It's a grassroots effort right here locally. Um, it's not anything to do with vast. I went out and, and because I've worked with Dina and the east side and the local businesses all throughout Derby for years trying to get access to them and it's getting harder and harder but we're still trying to make it a priority um, because it's harder to do what? Harder to harder to get trails because of development and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, the businesses want it. Uh, the owner of Hoagie said, you know, he's going to try to make it. He wasn't able to. Um, they really want it. They advertise. They pay money to get snowmobilers coming to their businesses. Um, and on the other hand, I want snow. I want snowmobilers to come see Newport, so that just like an island pond, now they're coming in the summer. They're coming in the fall because wow, there's a really nice city on a lake here, and it's a really nice place to go, and there's good places to eat, and nice places to stay. So it's kind of both. It'd be a nice day ride from Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, or even from Rangeley, Maine, if you if you were good enough, you know, uh, good enough, strenuous enough snowmobiler to get all the way from there to here, spend the night, and go all the way back to Rangeley, Maine. So that it's kind of both. Okay, it's a good question. So how far are you going to bring the groomer down? Where where does the groomer end? The groomer would end at the waterfront plaza because there's. So you drive down Broadview. Correct. Yep. And you're you're not going to plow Broadview. It's just going to be a snow. Uh, the groomer is not going to do anything on Broadview. Well, why why bring the, the uh, groomer down then? To because groom we'd have to groom the trail from where it takes off of Landing Street to the businesses. We wouldn't have to, but it's just a lot better for the snowmobilers. And if people are going to use it to cross country ski and stuff on, they're not going to want you know bumps and stuff from the snowmobiles. So we would groom it you know, right to where we possibly could. Just a second. I've got several hands up. I want to let people who haven't spoken a chance to speak. There's been a, did you want to speak, Ken? You had your hand up, and then there's a gentleman in the back. I'm going to let Ken go, and then the gentleman in the back, you can go next, and then I'll go to Laurie next. Uh, the four wheelers that put the tracks on that system, are they allowed on? Nope. A snowmobile has to have skis and a track. And they have to be a certain width, so they do not um, qualify as being so able to live on the Okay, but they're converted to Okay. Nope. There's a gentleman in the back. Bob, Bob yeah. Coles from Jordy. Roger, could you talk about the uh, state safety program for youngsters uh, born after a certain date? Yep, I was going to put that in my presentation, but I tried to keep it short. Um, so. Uh, anybody born after 1983, July 1st, needs to take a snowmobile safety certification. That's a class put on by the state police. I am an instructor for that. Um, and it's a class that's six hours long. It runs all day, and it involves knowing the ins and outs of the snowmobile, how to operate them safely, um, how the parts work, how they operate. Um, and we have people that are born before that date as well that attend it, just for the knowledge of knowing how to snowmobile safely. Um, and that, that since that 
the inception of that class, I can't give you exact numbers, but the amount of snowmobile incidents, um, collisions has gone down since that, that law has passed. So again, there is a fine if you do get caught without your snowmobile safety card, which you have to carry with you. It's just like a driver's license if you're not carrying that with you. So we are actively trying to, and we're actually putting one on at North Country Hospital this weekend. Um, the county is sponsoring it for free. Lunch is provided, donuts and, and stuff for the kids. And they're gonna come see real snowmobiles. They're gonna see what a groomer looks like. They're gonna see how narrow the trail gets when they're approaching a groomer. Um, we're trying to actively make sure that the sport is safer and safer as much as we can. Um, would you mind going back to the picture on your presentation of the uh, area right at Broadview? Uh, yep. Yeah, so is there, well, can, I think there's one that was a little bit closer. Um, is there a way to take the trail, um, instead of going down Broadview, is there any way to move it to go back onto the main road? I think that's Duchess, and then it comes down um, that way. I mean, I, I realize that is a, a, a main, well, I say it's a main thoroughfare. It's really not a main thoroughfare, except from in the mornings and in the afternoons during the school year in the winter. But is it, I'm just wondering if that would, um, because it's a wider street, if that would help the situation in that area? Uh, just a question. Um, so to answer your question, yes, we could run the trail down through there because in, in all reality, it's just doing the opposite of this here. But we figured this impacts less houses, and so that's kind of the goal. Now, if all these people were snowmobilers and loved us, then it probably would be easy to do, right? We're lovable people anyway, but um, if these two people own snowmobiles here, then we would go right by the supervisory union and down onto Hoskins that way. The options are kind of endless. It's just we're trying to keep things as straight and as, you know, because obviously, let me just do this next picture here. Um, this is, there's no houses here on this side of Landing Street, as you had mentioned. So that's kind of why we picked that. But. What about through the school, through the, by the tracks, straight down by <coughs> some bylaw that you can't go over school property? Because um, the major, the, the I'm, I'm a teacher at North Country, and also a business owner in Newport, and I understand both sides. But you see the top where you're coming down? Right here? Yeah, like keep going over, keep going over. This Don't you? Right. Yeah. Yep. Is there a problem there? Because you would not be impacting a lot of homes, um, and it's sort of a straight job to the east side from there. Well, it'd be more road, which we're trying to avoid. We don't okay. want to be on roads at all, okay. but unfortunately we have to for this. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd be going by several houses here. No, nope, you're way yeah. too over. Well, by, the the right by the railway tracks. By the railway right tracks. tracks. I don't know. I had to walk that to see if it's I even possible. I just know that there's it. probably a lot less homes sure, that I'm talking about. And, and I don't know if you've investigated that or if you're even allowed. I don't know. But, um, if, the, if the school gave us permission, we'd be allowed to. Um, we go by plenty so of schools statewide. So that would be the supervisory union? Yeah. Right, the supervisory union, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, this, if this railroad track ever goes and doesn't get used and for some reason right. the rails get removed, right. that would be the optimum. But I, I didn't yeah. even mean the, the railroad track. That's a good but idea. I, I think what uh, Fran's saying is, is it, it, it's just another at, option. I don't know if there's you no, look really at no that houses option. in that at all. There aren't any houses. Yeah, and the, there's off the top of my head, the only other thing I can think of is the terrain here is kind right? of right. It's it, you're going downhill. I know it very well. Hi, Mark. Hey, um, uh, yeah, Rick Woodward, uh, Derby actually, but uh, you said that they used to use the 91 corridor to get into town is that not an option? So, I mean, I know you can't because of state regulations with the interstate. You can't. But is there not something coming down that way that? Um, that's not an interstate. So yeah, we could. That's just a state highway. Um, but it's wider than it used to be. So and there's steep bank on both sides going both ways, as you know. So I think it would be more complicated. Plus we'd have to cross by the fire department and go in through Gardner Park and. But that's all non-residential. I, I agree, and and the way it used to go was go over the Gardner Park Bridge and then pop right up at the at the causeway there. Um, and I never rode it myself because it was way back before me. But 
Um, it's an option, maybe, I don't know. I, I Just driving by, I didn't think it would work that well, but yes. You know, it seems to me when you comment that it's a wider road, but there's steep banks, mm -hmm. as compared to being on a small road with people, that to me, the option for safety is fairly obvious. If you're concerned about the citizens of Newport who use the walking trails and hop pads and bike and snow bike and snowshoe and ski, and then there's a wider street, much wider, I don't understand why you would consider that a smaller street, you know, it's not that people love or hate snowmobiles, it's just that there's only so much you can put into a small area. And, you know, at some point in time, it breaks, the system breaks. And I feel that you're, you're stretching a very small area that has multiple traffic issues right now. You're asking it to stretch more at the expense of pedestrians. And that, to me, is really hard. Okay. Chief? <clears throat> in terms of the safety of the citizens in the area, um, I guess I would just say to the council, if the concern is that a snowmobile and a vehicle can't be on the road at the same time, then we have no business having that roadway be two-way traffic. Mm -hmm. It should be shut down to one-way traffic only because you can't have two vehicles that would go alongside one another. As far as the speed limit is concerned, I will tell you that when we implemented our snowmobile program and we've patrolled from uh, Jay Peak to um, almost to Island Pond, we have written a total of zero speeding tickets on snowmobiles. I'm not saying that speeding doesn't exist. Speeding exists on every street in the city every day. But I don't think it's as rampant as some might believe it to be in a residential type setting. And if it would, um, quell some of the concerns from the neighbors. I think if this council, Roger, and the police department were to sit down and come up with an enforceable speed limit, such as he suggested a 10 mile an hour limit and a um, curfew, along with regular patrols and the speed cart being utilized in that area, I, I don't think um, gathering a year's worth of data to find out is it going to be an issue or is not is unreasonable. This gentleman is back. I, I just like to make a comment that, you know, there are there are times that we never never rode horses down some of these side roads that we do today. We don't ride bikes. But if you do drive your car down a road and you come up upon a bicyclist, what do we do? We're very protective, aren't we? And you find that any snowmobiler comes upon somebody that's walking the side of the road, you'd be amazed how polite they are. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would just like to give, uh, offer the possibility that have the proper signage put up, have a period of time where you could enjoy the snowmobile going through, or not enjoy them as a trial. <laughs> and I think you'd be totally amazed, neighbors on Broadview as well, if you happen to go out there and watch these snowmobiles going by, going down to Dina's restaurant, going to Hoagie's, whatnot, and coming back up through and watch the speed that they are going, you'd be, you would, that's the only way you're going to make up your own mind. Right now you're very negative, which is okay. I'm scared. But you need to see. You need to see and observe and then analyze and say, we don't want this. Or we, yes, it worked. It's working. Can I, I I'd make like a to, um, can I let, I'd like to hear from Tom, Public Works, because um, he's the one that maintains the street. I'd like to hear his point of view. And um, He's been sitting there very quiet and the width of the road and how, how you thought in your mind that this was going to work. I 100% I support it. As much as uh, my, myself and my family travel uh, Canada, Maine, New Hampshire, it's, it's big business. You go anywhere uh, they, with the side-by-sides and four-wheelers and snow machines. Uh, any of these places you go to, the, the motels are full, the restaurants are full, gas stations. 
we can make it work on our city streets. Roger and I met today, looked at a few different spots that might be an issue, um, but we're certainly willing to work with them because I think the city can benefit from it as a whole. Okay, um, okay and, and then, yeah, and then. <laughs> You know, it, it's, well, it seems to me all very well uh, when it's on somebody else's street. But I, mm -hmm. I, as I think of it, if it happened on the street where I own the property, I'd be concerned with what happens to my resale value, what happens to the value of my house when I've got to tell a potential buyer that, you know, for five months of the year or four months of the year, there's this traffic coming by, it makes a lot of noise. It makes it a little more difficult to be out there walking, doing other things that I would normally do. And I, I would think it would be much harder to sell your house. What do you think? Or it could actually help you sell your house. It's I know not in a residential neighborhood. No. Yes, I Yes. Okay. Um, <coughs> yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I guess my question is, um, I'm assuming that I, what I've been hearing is that you've done some research on the best route. Um, and I guess I don't know enough backstory, I don't know if the council has enough backstory, maybe they do, about why you chose this um, route. Um, and I see a very, I don't, I'm not a snowmobiler, so I, I understand that there's a lot of people in this room that are. And I appreciate it, and I do know, as a business owner in Newport, that we do need more business in the winter time. Um, but I'm wondering if there is a better route that is less invasive and more safe for um, the people of Newport and get some builders into these businesses because I do value that. And depending on the year. Um, you know, when there's snow, snowmobilers come, and, and that's good for our state and good for our city. Um, but I think, I, I don't know if there's, I don't know if we know, I mean, you guys are all on the board and you're gung-ho and you're wanting to do well for Newport, and I appreciate that, but I don't know if, I don't know what thought has been put on into it and why there isn't an alternate route that you could propose. Uh, I, I, you can ask anybody in the back there, I live, sleep, and eat snowmobiles. I and, totally get that. And, and all I think about is where, how can I get snowmobiles to everybody? You know? And um, I really think this is the best solution. One, it's very short. We've already got a trail there. If we went down 191, uh, not only is the speed limit 50 miles an hour, but we do have to deal with some other issues with the terrain, and we have to do a really long <coughs> trail. So logistically and cost-wise, that's an issue. Plus, if I come in here and explain to a group of people that like to use Gardner Park, are they going to be happy about a snowmobile trail going through Gardner Park? I don't know, maybe. Um, so all I ask is, um, you know, you're, I, I don't like that you're scared of snowmobiles because that, that worries me. I don't like that mentality. And I would offer to you um, to, to check out my snowmobile, ride my snowmobile, um, come in the groomer with us, and I can show you that they're very safe machines. They operate just as well as any other motor vehicle on the road. Um, and it, what it comes down to is really a culture change in Newport. If, if you view a snowmobile as a small motor vehicle or a small car or a motorcycle for the winter time, then your mentality will change. Yes, and then, yeah, and then I'm trying to direct traffic and then be back. <laughs> just, just to clarify the usage of this potential route, this is a dead end. So people would be coming off the main trail and only taking this route if they were headed down to the east side or, or downtown. Correct. So it's not like it's going to be, you know, a huge... No, it's not. I mean, I, I don't want to say that it's only going to get two snowmobiles a day because what good is it then if it's not giving business to the east side and stuff? But it's not going to be a heavily traveled You can't trail. get anywhere from there. Right. right. Um, Why not go down through the lake? Excuse me, let me let Dean know, oh. and then I have something. I can attest that I live, sleep, and breathe on Landing Street. <laughs> and the only problem that we have with traffic would be the traffic coming from the high school at 2.40 in the afternoon. That's the only problem. 
So my question to the city would be, is there a way that we could control the school traffic, which would help Jill's concerns? Can I address that one? <laughs> Have you brought it to the Orleans County Sheriff's Department's attention? No. That would be my first step. If there is, a, if there is an issue in the school area, I would involve the SRO first to see what we can do to mitigate those issues. I agree 100% with what Dean is saying, but I don't want to, there may be something that they have in place that they need to tweak that's not working or something they need to improve upon, I don't know, but I'd rather have Sheriff Martin answer that question and get involved in that. You're, 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 talking, you're talking about traffic and the only excess traffic is when school lets out. Agreed. That's the only time there's excess traffic. Yes. And I run up that street and there's not a ton of people walking up there. And there are not a ton of houses there. And on Landing Street, you have one house that's occupied up on this road, two of them on the side hill. So Landing Street is the best option to get to the downtown area. You can go all over up in there and look at there, but that's direct and it's your best option. So I would say if we could control the school traffic a little bit, then I think all parties concerned would be it'd be a win-win situation. Let me see. Did you have something, sir? <laughs> I think. Uh, we were... Yeah, I, I guess it was just to say, you know, we, we keep using the word not safe or unsafe, but it's hard to use that when it's not proven because we have a great track record in the state. So to say something's not safe, you can't attribute that to snowmobiles when there's established issues that you're saying there is with traffic. Um, I know your, your husband talked about the groomer. It's a rubber track groomer. The drag itself has big pneumatic tires on it. I guarantee you will not hear that thing going by your house. I can guarantee you. And then this gentleman. Yeah, if you're worried, it seems that some people are worried about the school traffic. The greater part of the traffic you'd see coming in to these places would probably be on the weekend, because that's when a lot of people are out. And on the weekend, you don't have schools. And then, okay, we'll go back, and then I have something I'd like to say, too. First of all, I don't like being characterized as being negative. I'm not negative. When I say I'm scared, I'll explain. There's plenty of signage on my street right now. There's a stop sign at the end of Duchess, which spends more time on the ground than up. My neighbor's fence at 129 Broadview has been decimated by people not stopping, and the, the fence really doesn't exist anymore because I think she's just realized there's no point to try and keep putting it back up. So to me, you can put up all the signage in the world, you could put up flashing lights, you could put up multiple things. That does not change the fact that there's abuse of traffic. And, and the when fact does that abuse happen, Jill? Is it school, it's school time, correct? It happens during school a lot. But I also have to add, I have been walking in the park at night, and I have been menaced by snowmobiles who are joyriding around the entire park, and they love that dip. They come jumping out of the top of it, and I'm walking well away from the vast trails. I'm one little person on this earth, and I'm out there looking up at the moon with my nice little dog, and all of a sudden, there are six snowmobiles whipping around me, and it is, that is scary. <coughs> and, you know, when you say that I should think of a snowmobile as a car and just think of it as vehicular traffic and just think of it as another form of traffic, that is the problem. The problem is traffic. Mm -hmm. And I don't really care if, you, you know, whether you say it's going to be three-wheel traffic or motorcycle traffic or ATVs or snowmobiles, the problem still exists. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think it would help. Um, I would also be very interested to know how many tickets are given out to high school students right now um, because this is definitely a problem and I would be interested to see what will happen when high school students realize they can use Broadview Avenue as in a way to and from school. Well, the nice thing about the trail would be that hopefully that you'd either have a, a police officer there once in a while on a snowmobile or in a, in a cruiser. So you'd actually have increased police presence there. Um, well, I don't know if increased police presence on the street makes me feel like I live in a nice residential neighborhood. Because that's where I live right now. Uh, as far as um, 
My, I'm not a snowmobile. And there was a comment made, well, would you want a trail go by your house? Wouldn't bother me. I'll, I guess I'm open to try If it was 20 feet from your window? Um, well, bother? I'm one who likes to try different things, try different things to help businesses. Um, but if you're going to laugh, you can leave. Okay, ma'am? No, you don't. I'm serious. That was funny. If you're going to laugh, you can leave. I am speaking, and every time I seem to speak, you snicker and make comments, and you're I'm not putting up with it mind. anymore. I'm that not putting up with it funny. anymore. Other so now let me laugh. finish. Get over it. You can leave. No, you can leave. That oh, was no. funny. Why no, not laugh? Down. No. That's appropriate. Don't get into it, Ken. No, well, don't get into it, Ken. Don't go too far. If I have, get into it. as I was saying, if I get 20 feet from the house, I know people who have, the houses have actually gone up in value because of people who wanted to have a house by the trail. I look at this as kind of the same thing. Granted, they're not motorized and they're not noisy, but I look at this as when they had the issue along the lake with the bike path. There were people adamantly opposed. I know it's not comparing apples to apples, but they were adamantly opposed to that bike path. Completely. They didn't want a bike path. And I look at this as a way of attracting businesses and business to downtown. We struggle here. Dina knows. We struggle here in the wintertime. We don't have a, a mountain to skiers. And they build that mountain where no one has to leave anymore. I mean, they're opening up a movie theater up there, so no one's ever going to have to leave up there to come down to Newport. And so what we can do to bring people into town, I think, I think it's a win-win. And would I mind one going by my house? Not for the number of snow machines that you really can expect from this. I don't think you're going to see hundreds and hundreds coming down every weekend. Um, that's just my thought process on it. I, I'd like to address you real quick and say that if you're having trouble in the field, we as clubs want to be your biggest advocate as landowners. If you have an issue, we're going to come out and help you fix that. So if you let us know, maybe we know where you walk is off the trail, we can rope that. We can make that so they can't go through. We want to help you. We do. And just to, Thank you. Just to address, and he's 100% right, just to address your comment about not having hundreds of snowmobiles down here, he's absolutely right. Again, this is a bigger picture. We want somebody traveling out from Hartford, Connecticut on snowmobile to come back to Newport during the spring, summer, fall, buy a house, build a house up here, and stimulate the economy. That's the goal. And that's the follow-up, too. Well, I forgot to say, we have business owners who always come to, I know, me and the council say, what are you going to do to help us? What are you doing to help us? What are you going to do to make Newport more business-friendly? And I see this as one way of helping the businesses. Um, that's the way I look at it. If you've lived around here long enough, especially if you go up and down the Derby Road from Newport right up into Derby, you see the snowmobilers up there. They're polite. They follow the traffic rules as far as crossing the road. They'll stop. You let them go by. Hi, you want to see them in? They appreciate because they're letting it be done. The people are. You're going to have the renegade, I don't care what you do. But they put out the word, you talk to any of the snowmobilers, they put out the word, they're watching, if they catch something, they're stopped. So, it, it's hard, but if it's going to help Newport, sometimes you have to give or you have to bend a little bit. I have a question for the chief. Have we had any issues or complaints on, I can't see the, Freeman Street, Freeman. Freeman, from any of the neighbors, have you had any from Snow Machine? In what, no. no. Well, Freeman's got a, a bicycle path, they're right on the bicycle path. Well, no, but I'm just asking for like any complaints from the machines going down the path from the neighbors. Because I know that is heavily used by students going to the high school. Mm -hmm. That is the trail going to the high school. And if we had Broadview, I don't foresee any students trying to go home that way because it's going to be a dead end trail. They come across the lake. No, but they wouldn't. But when you said that if they come across the lake, mm -hmm. but they come across the lake, they have to cut across through the fishing access and then go up. Let's see, the fishing access is at the end of, can you call it that slide? Uh, Broadview. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's that's right here. So they do cut up, 
They do cut across there and go up right now, Broadview? Yes. yes. We have we have snowmobiles and we have ATVs that go uh, to the um, fishing access to do ice fishing. We have so them now. You now have an advocate to help enforce that to eliminate that if that's if that's a problem. But I will say this trail here, this is 14A, that sees way more traffic than this trail is going to see here. And these guys, again, we live in harmony with them. And the trail goes right just almost as close as it would be to your house. Well, it's a little bit different. There's a side, it goes, it doesn't go on the road. Correct. And it's across from any house. It's not near a house. And this right. trail most likely would be one of the first ones closed if the snow, yep. because uh, being a city street, yep. it would only really only be able to be open if we truly have snow. Yeah, I mean, so, okay, I can address that. So they're still going to plow it. It's not like they're going to leave snow for us. The snowmobilers will hug the shoulder, and of course, snow that falls down from the snowbank, that's where they're going to stay. We don't want to run bare pavement if we don't have to, but if it's a good, you can still have a lot of snow everywhere, and the street's still bare, that's, and that's normal. Um, a lot of snowmobilers have wheels that they have on their skis that help with that wear and tear, but again, they're, the street is not ever going to be completely clean all the way to the edges, so they'll take advantage of that snow on the edges. And that's not a salted street, correct? It so, is salted. Okay. Here. Oh, come on. Here. Yes, I'm Kevin Chikring. I live in Derby. I just had a question for you, young lady. If you feel harassed or endangered by snowmobiles, why haven't you called the police? I have talked to the school about snowmobiles. Nobody asked. I asked you why haven't you called the police if you feel in I danger, have harassed? I, you're interrupting me. Um, I have found, I've called the police on numerous occasions when people have slid off the road into my corner. I have called the police. On snowmobiles? No, I have never called the police on snowmobiles. No, I'm in the talking park specifically about snowmobiles. I have not done that at night. Okay. Well, if you felt out that you okay. were, you know, I, I, well, first threatened by motor point uh, taken. It was. Yes. Mr. Johnson, there's uh, been a lot of talk about traffic. I live on Park Avenue. There's two houses, myself and the one below me. Uh, you want to talk about traffic, <coughs> you ought to be there when school goes in the morning, comes out in the afternoon, every basketball game, football game, all summer long in Prouty Beach. Buses going to the east side. I mean, my living room probably isn't 40 feet from the middle of the road. I mean, I'm used to it now. It doesn't bother me at all. And we do occasionally get a snow machine up and down that street coming from the high school. Sorry about that. I, I, well, it's much more than, it's much more than after 11 o'clock and I never hear them. But, but we have a lot of traffic on that street. I mean, you can run the route down Dutchess and Park Avenue. There's nine houses on those two streets instead of seven on Broadway. But, I mean, we want to complain. We don't complain about the traffic. But if you want to see traffic, you want to be out there from 7 to 8 o'clock in the morning and from 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And when all the sports programs are going on, then you'll see traffic. Okay. Very good. So, thank you. Thank you. Again, please consider this for at least one year trial. We have to come back next year again for permission and and readdress it. That's all I ask is a one year trial and please consider changing the culture of, of how you guys feel about snowmobiles. We're here to help. Really, Paul, what is the next step after this? The next, oh, yeah, I want to let everyone know. Um, I was considering having this on the next council agenda, which would be the 18th. It's a couple weeks. That should be plenty of time to make a decision. We can't, the odds of it being open with the
what it says. Yeah. 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 Thank you. It's going so to be it? so you're most like, on, you're going to vote on the 18th? Well, not necessarily. So are you going to write a proposal? Or I'm trying to understand what you're going to do. Well, no, there's been a proposal. It's now in the it's, There's been a proposal to the city council. It's now in our hands to decide whether to allow it or not. Um, I mean, if we want to wait longer than that, what, what I would do is I would, I would recommend putting it on the agenda as a vote, so you have the option to vote, but you don't have to vote. Or how about we leave it at this? Why well, don't right? We can do it that way, but also. If council members have questions that they would like, I think he was to go see them. Um, well, we know where to find him. No, but if you have questions that you want to raise the council members or anyone in the audience, contact Tom, the city manager, the police chief, um, and have them answer the questions. You know, there might be, if you, as you think of questions, mm -hmm. um, contact them. Contact them. You know, our taxes went up considerably this year, 26%. And I know it's a burden for all Newporters. And I get that we want people coming into our city. But when you talk with the people from Hartford, Connecticut to come here to enjoy the city, I get that. But it shouldn't be done on the backs of the people who live here and work here and walk and recreate here every day. And I really feel that you know, my street, having lived there the longest of anyone, is being used as a sacrificial offering. And it doesn't make me feel very good as a Newport resident. I work here, I live here, I raise my children here. I also grew up in Quebec. And I can tell you right now, there's no such thing as sidewalks and snowmobile trails that coexist. They make great snowmobile trails up in Quebec and they drive like maniacs and they enjoy them and that's how they do it. They keep it exclusive. Okay, okay, we've heard you, we've heard you. Well, I don't think you really have, I'm sorry to say. Well, have you? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, we have. Thank we you. Have. Did you have a question? No? Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm moving on. The next item. Errors and omissions on the grand list. This is a, a house that was in the process of being built. Um, while the appraisal was going on. And uh, that's why it needs to be included into the grand list. It's a new, new property. So we have to add this? Yeah, they, they missed it. They missed it? They missed it? Yeah. So we need a motion to accept this into the grand list. Yeah. So moved. Motion made. Is there a second? Second. You get it. <coughs> made and second. A discussion on this. Then all those in favor say aye. 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 All those ayes have it. Motion carried. Next item: Water sewer utility van replacement. Mr. Bernie. Uh, you must all get the memo that I wrote. Uh, basically, it's what it says: 2007 uh, van that is a crucial piece of uh, equipment that we have. In response to any emergencies for water, sewer, anything for that matter. Um, with the new inspection laws, it is no longer inspectable. Go ahead. Go on. Um, second paragraph, we did not generate the current operating budget in anticipating this vehicle's failure. Um, however, we are at a point where we need to immediately replace this vehicle. At what point I guess through that procedure when you were doing your budget, did you not realize that this vehicle would have to be replaced and not be replaced? You follow what I'm saying? In other words, was the was the damage that would not allow it to be inspectable? Was that before 
your budget process, or you just notice that after? <laughs> what, what we, the way we, with the new inspection laws now, what Larry and the PA is doing now, I mean, obviously it runs out at the end of December. Uh, so last year it wasn't a big issue. They didn't really look at the vehicle like they are now. Uh, he's been bringing all our vehicles in for a pre-inspection, so we don't have any hidden surprises. Um, and with the amount of frame rot on the back of that truck, it will not pass inspection. Should I be looking at all our vehicles now? Yeah, we are heavily looking at all of them to see, hopefully, year out where what, what vehicle is going to be an issue and I'm not going to be able to use it. Um, go ahead. It's not going to be in my mind. No. I wouldn't do that. Oh no! I, was, I, was gonna say do, I thought you were going to say dollar amount of bids. No, actually, um, trying to formulate this here. Um, so you don't currently have a process where you check all your vehicles. Like nobody, when they're inspected, nobody checks them at that time and says this is going to be an issue well, within you, the next twelve months or. Typically, Larry will know, we'll all know what the, the equipment, if it's a major issue, but nowadays, if you're, you're probably everybody's well aware of how the inspection laws have gone, um, you can have a little bit of a, a hole in, the, in your fender in your vehicle, and it's not going to pass inspection. Tell me about it. Um, so, yeah, last year wasn't an issue, this year is a major issue. Okay. And funds. I do have funds in there. I may even have enough funds to purchase it outright, um, but depending probably would be quote. a, what's that? Depending on the quote that you get. Yeah. Correct. Are you going to go out to bid and get quotes? I, as I wrote in my memo, I would rather not. Uh, Wintertime is, that vehicle can be heavily used with water sewer issues. Uh, what we plan on doing is taking everything that's currently in that that unit in the back of it and relocating it back into a new vehicle. That's going to be a process in itself. I'd like to start the process now, go to the three local dealers and have them do a search, see what we can find, and just swap it out. If I do a bid system, I might as well put it in the new budget. It'll be July before I buy one anyway, uh, basically. Well, I was going to say, what's the estimated dollar that you're looking to spend? Just curious. I know, I, I'd have vehicle. to say, uh, being a, a ton truck like that, it's probably between forty and fifty thousand at a minimal. That's okay. Maybe a little more. The fiberglass body, you can reuse that. No, that that's that is what is really the worst of that vehicle. It's the frame of that body. So it's the fiberglass. It's no good. Correct. I mean, I, I didn't come to you and say, okay, I want to buy a new fiberglass back in to put on a brand new one to put on a 10-year-old vehicle that probably a year or two down the road, I'm going to be in the same boat with the frame, uh, the cabin chassis with the, the van itself. But it was really the back end that's the worst part. Thank you. Mr. Wilson, did you have? No, I was going to say, rather than, can you just go out locally quickly? That's what I planned on doing, with your approval. I'd go see, I'd go yes. to North Point, and then Hayes, on the 18th, you tell us which the three I don't know if I could find one that quick, but... Yeah. Uh, but you can get specs, you can have specs, you can go to the dealer, oh, and they say, well, like, what do you want for this price? We pretty um, much want to replace what we currently have, yeah. the same, right. similar style vehicle. It's got to be done. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so... Probably by the next meeting, I, I'll probably have some information for him. That's what I was just saying. He'd go out, get the information. Correct. On the 18th, we vote. We're going to need a vehicle. So you got to the library. He's just hoping he can come in with a cheap. You got three vote. dealers locally anyway. That so let's have a motion to authorize Tom to go out and look for a van replacement. So sure. Motion and made second. and seconded. Any other discussion on that? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you. Budget review. Laura, do you have anything? Just wanted to let folks know that um, uh, unless there's further questions, 
the um, the budget is ready for <coughs> approval, but we do not have the final figure from Newport City Ambulance. We're not expecting that until our next meeting, and you may prefer to wait um, to see what that final figure is going to be. So I'm actually planning on them being up the next agenda. So hopefully that'll wrap things up. Anybody I has would any prefer questions? to wait till we hopefully get the numbers from the ambulance. Right, is that doing some kind of And then yeah. a couple other issues have been raised, and we can think about those. Oh, I can answer. Right. If that's okay, I can answer the communications question. Do you mind? Mm -hmm. So the communications line item is spread out and shared throughout all of the departments. And inside every communications, there are portions of it that are dedicated to a variety of things, including, here we think, internet, phone service. For the campground, we also have television. We have, um, this is phones, cell phones. We have a call, always on call service. We have um, our technical assistants from Beloins Computing. He's our IT guy. And let's just see our Google account and our website. I think that's everything. So you just divide it up amongst every department. Every, that's why it shows up on the each. That's why you're seeing so many communications line items across the spectrum. We have a percentage um, that we show uh, in terms of who uses the bulk of what. So it's broken down pretty consistently across the various things that we, we use that uh, line item for. Mr. Mayor, I also use that line item for our uh, fire fire alarms at the Public Works facility. Mm -hmm. Any uh, news ads or uh, you know want ads that we we'll put out there for hiring, all goes to communications. Okay. Oh, our postage meters in there. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty expensive. Okay. And there was a question raised about dispatch. If you want to answer the question. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't understand what the, I, I don't remember what the question was. Well, you're adding $55,000 to the dispatch budget to hire another dispatcher in the hopes that uh, some other communities may come online. Um, in the last year, I think you've had one community total come online, and you have, as Mr. Wilson pointed out, you've had the ambulance service, but that's a wash since we pay for the ambulance service. So you've had $10,000 as income, and now you want to spend another fifty-five dollars in the hopes that some other people might come online. I would suggest it would be better to get a commitment from five different communities that they will come online if you hire somebody else so that you can do close to 24-7 kinds of work. And then at that point, when we know that we've got five more communities, we, um, we hire somebody as opposed to just having somebody who's just going to do very little work. Yeah, so to my response to that would be that <clears throat> ultimately I'm looking after the citizens of Newport. And if other entities choose to come on at a price of $10,000 per, all the better for the citizens of Newport. This is about us providing for our own. And we've had a myriad of issues throughout the last couple of years um, with state police dispatching services. And this is a way to mitigate some of those issues before something potentially worse happens. Um, in addition to the idea that back in, I think it was, it was before my tenure, I'm gonna say 1993-esque, we had 24-7, 365 dispatch in the city with many less calls and many less issues that we have today. We're trying to basically rebuild to those 1993 numbers before we do anything above and beyond. <coughs> now, if and when 
uh, legislature chooses to enforce the idea that communities are going to have to pay for dispatch, I can't imagine there are going to be too many communities out there that are going to choose to stay, if they're even allowed, to stay with an entity in Williston when they can have local dispatching services with local knowledge and local buy-in um, here in our area. Okay. Anything else with regards to the budget? No, uh, just to let you know, uh, we had talked about having a special meeting on December 11th, and I just want to clarify whether or not the council feel that's needed. That was specific for the budget review. I doubt I'll have the ambulance figures by then, but... Uh, no, no, we won't. Yeah. Well, we may not have the ambulance data back by then. Right, right. So, so we can have as part of the regular meeting on the 18th. Uh, yeah. And hopefully we have the ambulance figures. Just <coughs> think about it, sharpen their pencils. Oh, uh, they're doing it tonight. They're doing it, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Great. All right. So then, for we'll me, leave what, it at that then. right? For me, that confirms there won't be a special meeting um, on December 11th, and I'll have this back on the agenda for December 18th. That's what I want to teach. Very good. Great. All right. Thank you. Moving on. We're on new business. Yes. I did have another question about why you can't use Walmart money for another twenty thousand dollars of Renaissance. Letting the um, letting the citizens not have to pay for it, but using a Walmart money, which is supposed to be for economic development, that would save us twenty thousand okay. dollars. Um, using the Walmart funds to offset the budget, I don't believe is the intent of the original agreement. The original agreement is posted on our website. Um, it's really to talk about um, offsetting impacts that could conceivably come to Newport as a result of Walmart. Um, those funds um, are, uh, any use of those funds are proposed to do just that, which is to um, invest in our economy in ways that will truly have a long-term impact to offset what those anticipated impacts are likely to be. Um, typical use would be um, using it uh, for the NCRC half-time position. Another typical use that I would advocate for is using it um, for the first phase of the TIF consultation to help the city go through that process, which is anticipated to be at about an 18-month process. The phase one of that process is anticipated to be $20,000. The phase two is anticipated to be $30,000. Um, my recommendation to the council would be any unspent funds would be set aside in a, uh, an account set aside for a longer term impact. We don't know what some of the results of the studies are going to be at this particular point. We don't know what the recommendations of the consultant are, is going to be. We're also in the process of the RFP for the landscape architect to work <coughs> with Whitenburg. And there may be something that's coming out of that that would be very unique and a one time opportunity. So we want to we want to hang on to those funds uh, for as long as possible. Once we have more clarity on on what some of the recommendations that are are going to be that are um, doable for this community, if we spend all our money on offsetting our budget, we're, we'll have nothing left. We'll have nothing left for a long term investment. Okay. All right. Moving on. New business, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Wilson. Are you looking for the business? No, thank you. Okay. Old business. No. Mr. Wilson. No. Mr. Wilson, any old business? I don't have any, any old business. Any old business? Just December 13th is the Vermont Council on Rural Development's Community Visit Day. So under old business, I would remind folks that that's a happening thing. Um, the dinner is going to be held in our municipal building. It's going to be catered by the east side. I want to let folks know that Community National Bank has offered to pay the bulk of that dinner as a contribution to the, to the effort, which is really lovely. So I want to give them kudos for that. Um, the postcards that the city is generating are due to be mailed out tomorrow. 
So you should have them in your mailbox Wednesday and Thursday to remind folks to come. That was part of our commitment to the project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And um, hopefully those will be well received and it'll be a good turnout. And child care is provided. Food and child care. Food and child care. All right, very good. I'm not taking any more questions. Okay. I was just looking for date, if we know the dates of the other two meetings. They get decided. It, it just seemed them. awfully short timing that the community found out about about this meeting uh, coming up on the 13th. So it's been out there. Well, they they are the ones in charge of it, not us. The, the steering committee on the VC VCRD we met yeah. that night. We picked a date. And then it was up to them to start publicizing it. And as soon as we had a date, I believe the city put it out on. It was, it was put it out was on the a, website. It was put out in, I think, the newspapers. It was a multi-effort. Um, it was multi-effort. I don't think it's old or no. Reminder that on the 16th, if council members haven't responded to the Pomelo party, show the kids. Oh. The 16th, which is before the next meeting, so yes, we all need to let the rec department know what we're coming to. Know. That's all right. Great, thank you. All right, thank you. That's it. Yeah. Then the next meeting is going to be December 18th, 6 30 p.m. And then the centennial meeting is on the 19th at 5 o'clock. We need a motion to adjourn. So Motion made. Is there a second? Sure. Made and seconded. Discussion? And all those in favor say aye. 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 aye.